Hey, this is John Fernay, the co-host of the Maryland Crabs, and I am here today with a Maryland Crab Cake for your listening pleasure. What's a crab cake? It's not quite a full episode, it's just a little snippet. Stay tuned and check it out. And make sure you check us out on themarylandcrabs.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs Podcast or find us on Facebook at the Maryland Crabs Podcast. And don't forget, subscribe, rate us, iTunes, go there now. Today we are talking with Glenn Fuston, and I did not screw up the name, so I'm pretty happy about that, who is the executive director of GoCaps, and that is a acronym that's been thrown out because the state loves to go with acronyms, and I just really recently realized that that had nothing to do with the hockey team that is probably not going back to the Stanley Cup again. <laughs> GoCaps is the Governor's Office of Crime and Control Prevention. You are the executive director, and what exactly is the Governor's Office of Crime and Control Prevention. So our office is responsible. First of all, let me say thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. I didn't have you. You came came here. That's true. (laughs) Uh, Our our office is set up to uh, do several things. We administer uh, grant funds as our primary purpose for the governor's office. We get the federal funds that come from the federal government. We also get state funds that are focused on crime control and prevention efforts, and then we administer them back out to the community. So we get about 45 different funding sources into our office. Okay. And then produce about 800 hundred sub awards back out to local governments, nonprofits. Now is that through a year? Yep. Through a year. Every year we have about that many grants. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, so your office is not, I mean, you're not arresting bad guys and, uh, and, and not you're, you're funding, you're giving the, the tools for people to do. And obviously I, I'm assuming you've got some report, you know, some report, <laughs> report backs. Certainly. Um, you know, you can't just give away you know, that kind of money and not have. Yeah, certainly. We, we definitely have accountability, which is big for the governor. I mean, governor really is pushing on accountability this year uh, and for the past four years, matter of fact, on what are we doing with the taxpayers' money. So, you no, know, we're not out in the street arresting people. I see my job, our job, as facilitating and allowing the police officers, men and women that are out on the streets, uh, to do their jobs, do what they do best. But we also, it's important that we, um, the governor have us focusing on multidisciplinary response. So we're working with enforcement, but we also do work with victim services and prevention as well. Well, that's one of the neat things. I was looking at the website, and I mean, just some of the, the stuff that you've recently done. I mean, you, you've got a, uh, and I don't know whether it's bilingual, but trilingual or whatever, but you're funding alternative Languages other than English, yep. uh, we'll call it bilingual, but I mean, primarily Hispanic, I would think, in, in the area. Uh, when you get a crime victim that doesn't know how to communicate with the police, I mean, in Annapolis, we're fortunate enough that we do have an Hispanic liaison. Anne Arundel County is mm-hmm. doing very well with that. But I mean, I imagine there's probably some areas of the state where, you know, you could certainly have an officer going, you know, boy, speak some English. I can't, I can't understand you. Right. And this is the ability to, you know, this is something that you could fund a position for, say, out in Garrett County or Allegheny County to, to have somebody that could respond and say, okay, well, let's let's translate. Certainly. You know, I think the governor's really pushed hard on the fact that we're not going to solve any of these crime issues by simply focusing on enforcement. We have to have the victim's voice in there. We also have to have a prevention effort in there. So a program like that, a trans um, translation service or a multilingual person allows us to talk to the victim, make sure the victim is becoming more safe, becoming self-sufficient, and have access to information. It's real difficult, and especially in uh, you know family abuse and, and abu- abuse of women and spousal abuse, which mm-hmm. actually can go both ways. It doesn't necessarily need to be against a woman, but it can go to a man. And I know that you guys have helped fund the uh, YWCA, which has a huge abuse outreach. They've got a new house that they just built in an undisclosed location, which yeah. is where it should be. But I know that you know for crime victims, you had recently funded them for like half a million dollars and um and then there's other some smaller ones that go out there as far as you know to fund that 100 percent. we're really proud i mean when we talk about uh the ywca uh in, in particular molly uh, knife is Knipe a is great good. friend a uh, great person in the community and the governor has been very supportive there as well he actually put money in his capital budget to uh help fund the uh the new center, the undisclosed center, and we were there for the grand opening. Right. What a beautiful center. She yeah. does an incredible yeah. job. But yeah, reaching into victims such as domestic violence victims uh, is one of the things that um, we're most focused on and trying to get out there. And again, we have three goals when it comes to victims. We want to make sure they're safe. 
that they become self-sufficient and they have access to information. Well, that makes sense. With any kind of domestic violence, too, that tends to be a, a, a silent victim mm-hmm. as, as, as it goes with rape. I mean, a lot of, you know, the rapes are not reported. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, was it my fault? Did I do something? Could I have done something different and everything else? And, it's, and there, there's, you know, to a degree, I guess there's some shame that goes with the victims and, uh, and any kind of resources that we can give them is, is way to, the way to go. Certainly. What's the measurement of the success of your office? I mean, obviously, you look at crime statistics. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I imagine uh, Baltimore, I'll say, you don't, you, you don't, you can, you can, you can silently nod or stomp three times on the floor or something like that. But I mean, I've got to imagine Baltimore is a bit of a problem. You look at some of the statistics, you look at the, the, the murder rate that has been up there that doesn't seem to be uh, appeasing at all. You know, how does... How does your office, you know, work with that and focus on that? I mean, does, you know, can you justify giving money to an organization, you know, vis-a-vis Baltimore City that doesn't appear on one angle and certainly from the most visible angle to be working as well as it had been hoped? Certainly. You know, I think, I mean, to your, the bigger question, how do we measure our office? Our office's vision is a safer Maryland. So we're looking at any way that we can show that Maryland is safer. And, and, and I agree with you. Unfortunately, in Baltimore City, we see the homicide numbers, the violent crime numbers going up. Uh, and one of the things that the governor is really focusing on is that accountability piece, how we know how much money we give to Baltimore City. My office gives about $37 million a year uh, to Baltimore City for victim services, prevention, and enforcement. And what we've instituted over the years is measurements. So we're looking at the outcomes that we're getting from those grants. Can we show direct impact? Okay, so these are victims that have gone through the system that have been, I don't want to say abused by the system, but have, have gone through. And as you said, they're looking to see that, that they're, they're safe, they've, uh, they're, they're accounted for, and mm-hmm. they're, they're moving forward. Right, 100%. So they're victims, but then we also, for example, one of the things that the governor has in his budget is we fund 75 police officers in Baltimore City uh, directly for community policing efforts. So we have 75 police officers, Baltimore City police officers, that the gov- governor funds through our office uh, for these uh, police officers to be on the streets, working in neighborhoods, developing a relationship in those neighborhoods to try to reduce crime. So we're looking at those crime statistics as well. Can we measure the impact that they're having in the specific neighborhoods that they're focused on? Now, do you, do you have a background in law enforcement yourself? So my Does background, it? I spent 17 years in the federal government working um, on a federal task force for reducing uh, drug trafficking in the United States. Okay, so you're uh, you're, you're pretty pretty well informed on yeah. that. Community policing, we hear that term an awful lot. I know Annapolis City right now is going through a big thing. They're looking for a new chief and everything else. And we hear community policing, community policing. You just brought it up for Baltimore. Uh, in your experience and from what you've seen, I mean, is that is that the key to think, making a safer city? I think a community policing is, is part of the solution. I, I think when we look down uh, at uh, at the problem of violent crime or crime in general, I think what we have to understand is that not one discipline is going to be the answer. We can't look just to enforcement. We can't just look to prevention. We can't just look to these different areas. We have to look to come together and and and, and work together across the disciplines. And the community certainly plays a role in that. You know, we just met, the governor met with um, some victims at the Roberta's house who provide services to um, uh, homicide victims in Baltimore City. And I, one of the things that they identified is it has to start, start in the community. I can come in, I can provide whatever resources I can, money into the city. But if the community is not going to be, be behind it, it's going to be very difficult to make a change. What would you say... We look at violent crime across the state and and whatnot. And I, I'm not going to pinpoint what what violent crime, but is there anything that you, in a magical world, could inject into our situation or remove from our situation that would make an immediate and sizable difference? I think the immediacy is tough uh, when you say the immediate and sizable. I think one of the things that the governor has done that is going to and has had made a uh, an impact is, again, looking at three different aspects. We have an enforcement program. We have a, a program called the Maryland Criminal Intelligence Network, which is bringing law enforcement agencies together. We have 13 sites around the state. They're all sharing information with the federal government, uh, with state government, with local government. So they're doing a better job of identifying these violent criminal networks that are operating across the city to bring crime. But we're bringing behind that, we're bringing programs and sustainability. So when you go into a community, uh, wherever it might be, as you mentioned, and you take out a gang, let's say it's MS-13 or the Bloods of the Crips, right. we have to bring services in behind that. So we're funding PAL centers, police athletic leagues, or boys and girls clubs right in behind that. That's fantastic. Okay. So, so I think that's going to be what makes this change. And then at the same time, we're providing services. To the well, this is, this is like when we go to war in some foreign land, we've 
got to you know rebuild rebuild it after we after we get out and figure out what um, what's going on there. Certainly. What's the biggest crime that's fa- that Maryland is facing on a statewide level right now? Would you think uh, the biggest crime? Uh, you know, well, right. We're focused on. I, I guess the problem, the biggest problem that we're. This is. Wow, uh, the biggest problem. You know, certainly uh, crime is there. The violent uh, repeat offenders is a, is a challenge, but opioids uh, obviously are a big challenge for our, our state right now. And uh, Steve Shu, the executive director of the Opioid Operational Command Center, uh, is doing a great job uh, of driving that forward. Um, but it's certainly a focus that we have to look at. Right. Well, I know. I know he established the Safe Stations program here in Anne Arundel County when he was county executive, and that was, uh, by all by all measurements, a, a, a very good success. A couple sort of watershed moments when uh, when Steve was kicking that off, there was somebody that came into a fire station at the time. And I remember when uh, Governor Hogan kicked off, and I'm going to screw up the name of the thing, but it's uh, the either the text or the phone line for safe schools, yep. like to report bullying or whatever it was. As he was announcing that, the first call had come in. Right. I mean, the opioid thing is, is huge, and it's interesting. And before we started recording, I told you that my daughter is down in North Carolina, and they don't have a, the heroin opioid problem. It's their drug of choice right now is meth. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm finding that as I read and learn more about it, that it is different places of the country. And True. Maryland tends to, for such a little itty bitty state that uh, everybody thinks Baltimore is the capital of, <laughs> right. uh, we rank right up there. We do. You know, we don't have the population center that some of the other states have. We don't have, um, but we, we've we got a really big problem. The CDC had some statistics on age of overdose death and the number of them in Maryland. And in not so much that we've gone from in 2014, we had 1,070 deaths statewide. In 2017, according to the CDC, had 2,247. So that's about doubled. Yep. And that's not shocking to me from what I know. But what this one did is that in 2014, the average age of the person who overdosed was 17.4 years of age. And today, or last in 2017, it's 36.3. So we've doubled the age of the people that are overdosing. Um, why Why is? do you have any idea or any crystal ball as to why the users are getting older? Well, I wish I had that crystal ball. If I had the crystal ball, it would make it a lot easier. I mean, I think the theory is uh, that we have is, remember that Baltimore has been uh, the heroin capital for a long time. Uh, Heroin has been in Baltimore City for, you know, 50 years or so. Sure. And I think that you have an aging population certainly there. But you also have the dynamics of changing with the opioids. How are opioids getting into the system? How are people becoming addicted to those opioids? Do you have older people that are uh, on pain uh, medicine and they're getting getting prescribed opioids, and that's creeping this age up. But you're 100% right. I mean, we've heard stories of people in um, adult communities that are trading opioids. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's real. Well, I know that I had uh, some knee surgery several years ago, about five years ago, and I left uh, the hospital, and they were like, well, okay, here's a, per- here's a prescription for Percocet, here's a prescription for Super Duper Tylenol, there was something else, and they said, no, and here's, here's a bunch of morphine for you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, get ahead of the pain was what they told me, and I, I've never done any hard and I don't know that I'm not an addictive type of a person. Right. Uh, and that, that just, quite frankly, scared the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. And I took some op- or some opioids, some uh, morphine when I got mm-hmm. home because they were saying that. And it felt tight in my chest. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I just don't like the feeling of this. And I said, okay, I'm just going to muscle through the pain. And it wasn't, ultimately, it wasn't that bad. And I, I dealt with a Tylenol. But here's the hospital discharging me with, you know, a pharmacy of opioids Mm -hmm. Uh, and they all went to the police station in the drop boxes which are uh, I'm sure that's probably in some way funded through your you guys as far as being able to put the drop boxes at the police stations and fire stations I think there are some libraries too in some places but I think that uh, you look at that I know that we uh, had a former uh, Anne Arundel County State's Attorney Wes Adams and he was saying the same thing that when he was checked out from his I think it was back surgery he said they they warned me they they get a big warning he said you're going to be constipated and he's just like, that's all? That, that, that's, that's all you're right. giving me here? Right, right. Um, and I know that, that we've not been very successful in going after prescribers. There's been a couple of success stories here and there, but prescribers, doctors, pharmacies that are filling it. And certainly we have not been very successful at going after the people that are dealing the drugs, mm-hmm. um, securing convictions on that anyhow. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what, what the solution is, uh, and, it, and it continues to grow. I mean, we're looking at the uh, the number of deaths, the number of overdoses, I believe, are down so far this year, but the number of deaths are still increasing. 
Oh, I think it's important to look at what the, the threat is. You know, and a lot of times um, when we look at the opioid problem, we look at um, drugs like Oxycontin, Oxycodone, and those types of things. Uh, and if you roll back to the 14, 15 years, you were seeing deaths from heroin that were going up. The deaths from heroin are actually going down now. And what the death rate that's going up is fentanyl. So they brought this synthetic opioid into this mix. And I remember Lieutenant Governor Rutherford had said that the latest cocktail is cocaine with fentanyl. Yeah. And that's scary. I mean, that's a speedball. I mean, that's an up and a down or bringing together two drugs that are just dangerous. And, and these fentanyl, when you're mixing it in, you have to remember that uh, fentanyl is extremely potent and extremely... Well, it's lethal. Yeah, lethal. I mean, yeah. And it's not a chemist that's mixing it together. So yeah. it's some guy that's standing in front mixing cocaine well, with he's looking, looking at me. I mean, and the reason, the reason that they're mixed, I mean, and you probably could address this, but I mean, in, in my ignorance here, but the reason that they're mixed is because profit. Yeah, right. I mean, I've got I've got a product, cocaine or heroin or whatever, that's worth one hundred dollars, whatever it is. But if I throw some fentanyl, which gives you the same buzz or whatever it is that I can buy for a nickel, I can put that in and. One hundred percent. I mean, from the uh, the distributor side, they're looking for the profit. But I tell you, what we heard in the community, and it actually was right in this community when we did a, a case several years ago with Anne County, is the guys, uh, the users, were looking for the the good shit. Excuse my language, but and the good shit was the the drugs with the the fentanyl with the fentanyl on it. it because it's a high it's a higher high. Uh, and they were looking for it. So they were actually hearing people die uh, and flocking to that area in order to get that drug. You know what I would love to see some organization do? And I pitched this to Wes Adams, and it was problematic. I pitched it to every cop I've talked to. and may, may, So I'll pitch it to you, and maybe you can go to, go to Governor Hogan. But there's such a prevalence of people saying, oh, my kid would never do that. Uh, I mean, you've got the whole thing that, again, County Executive Sh- Steve Shu had the Not My Child programming that's out there. Um, and it is. It is your child. And don't, you know, when I was, uh, I think I'm older than you, but when I was young, I mean, we heard about heroin and we heard about, you know, the, oh, those, those those nasty drug dealers, the crack dealers, they're living on the corners, homeless in Baltimore, dealing with the bad people and, and everything else. And it never really hit mainstream America, right. uh, whether it was lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class or upper class. Now it knows no bounds. Uh, there is, and I mean, I knew nobody that was outwardly addicted. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I can, I've got probably a dozen friends that have either lost children, have lost siblings that their neighbors have. I mean, it's, it's really hitting home. And I would love to see a program, a public program that sit there and say, where you could send somebody out, start a time clock up behind the speaker Mm-hmm. And say, okay, I'll be back as soon as I score some heroin. Now, obviously, we've got some legal legal issues there Couple that you've got to you've yes. got you've got you know you've got to give the guy that was selling it a, a break, and you got you know the guy that possesses it. But I think that it would be a great way to look. There was a guy from the FBI that I remember when my kids were very little was talking about uh, online porn and, mm-hmm. and predators and stuff like that, and, and he knew all the places to go, which. The predators do as well. And as he was sitting here talking, he's going on Yahoo chat. And, and he just asked somebody in the audience said, hey, who's got a kid that might be online here? And what's his first name? That was the only information he was given. And it was went there. Boom. Identified. Found the kid. Got a last name. Did a little bit more Googling and, and looking at this and this and this. And he says, OK, well, here's what I know. I said, your name is Frank. I didn't ask you that before. Your wife's name is Mary. You gave $100 to the booster club. You get home at 3 o'clock. You work here. Your dog's name's Fluffy. And your kid wears number eight playing soccer. Um <laughs> You know, inside of about a 20 minute period. But to be able to turn around and do that and have somebody come back in and say, yeah, here's here's my baggie of heroin. You know, you do it in a in an affluent community up in, uh, you know, whether it be Savannah Park or in Davidsonville or into Bethesda or Chevy Chase or wherever it may be. I think I think it would just be such an eye opener because so many people are in denial that it's. You know, no, it's it's somebody else's kid that's that. That's you know, little Tommy's the bad kid, not not my little Frankie. Right. I, I certainly agree. I think that one of the things we have to do is we have to remove that stigma uh, around it. One is we have to get people talking about it, uh, so that we can have that conversation with my child. I have a 14 year old son and a 10 year old daughter, uh, and I have these conversations with them regularly. And I agree with you 100. percent A lot of people don't think it's here. I mean, and I, I just looked at some statistics. I mentioned the uh, Maryland Criminal Intelligence Network that the governor put forth, and just in Anne County in Annapolis for the last year, uh, they've identified 13 drug trafficking organizations. So a drug trafficking organization is an organization with five or more members uh, that is trafficking drugs either locally, multi-state, or internationally just in Anne Arundel County in Annapolis. There's 13 of them. 
13 and, groups. And that could be that could be a group of five or it could be a group of 105. 100%. And there's ties. We see the ties. In, in, in addition to that, we see, you know, 15 gangs that are operating. We know gangs that are operating here. They're usually known for distribution of drugs in, in the community. We look at firearms tracking. We look at human trafficking. This is in Anne Arundel County. This isn't in L.A. This isn't in New York City. This is here, right here in our neighborhood. That's terrifying. Is there any one particular group? I mean, is it? I, I mean, I, I know that MS-13 tends to be largely Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Are they? You know, do we have white groups and black groups and Hispanic groups and Asian groups? I mean, is it? it is it going all across the board? Certainly, you know, I don't know the exact breakdown of all mm-hmm. of the gangs uh, off the top of my head, but certainly MS-13 has a presence here. There's a um, presence of, of several other gangs, and, and they're impacting our community and, and driving it forward. I mean, right here in Annapolis, uh, there is gang presence. The city and the county have worked together, and they've done a, a, as good of a job. I don't say as good of a job as I can because that makes it sound like that you know they, they couldn't do more. But with, with what they've got, they're doing, they're doing a good job. I think mm-hmm. it's just very difficult to get ahead of it. Certainly. Um, I mean, there's an awful lot of incentive to, for the gangs to continue on and, and to move on. Certainly. And I think the other thing that for the community to understand, and it's a hard balance sometimes, is that these investigations take us a long time. So I know for a fact that Anne Arundel County uh, and Annapolis City uh, have done investigations that are month-long investigations that have taken them out of the country. So, I mean, you're looking at, you know, the county police or the city police that are now investigating, you know, with our federal partners into other countries. So these aren't just very quick arrests. It's a tough one. It it's is. A, it's a tough different. one. Uh, I mean, and you're, you're tasked with this. So, I mean, this is kind of a heady, uh, a heady job description you've got. <laughs> it is. You, it you, is. You've, you've got there. I love it, though. i got a great um, boss. What are the success stories out of the, the Go Caps program? You know, I think that one of the biggest successes that we have uh, in Go Cap is that we're, we're opening the, com- the communication lines between disciplines. You know, when I got into the the law enforcement field, and I want to make it very clear, I've never been a sworn law enforcement officer. I've never been brave enough uh, to be uh, one of them, but I've always been in a support role. I've uh, run intelligence operations and the like. But when I got engaged about 20 years ago, you didn't see the communication between law enforcement and victim services and public health uh, and the like. And I think what you've seen from Governor Hogan and Lieutenant Governor, Governor Rutherford is we've brought those communities together and said, you're going to talk. We're going to work together. And that's one of the things that we pride ourselves in our office. Uh, you know, as I've mentioned, we, we're dealing with enforcement, victim services, and uh, prevention. And if we can bring those entities together and have public health talk to public safety and talk to the victim services world, I think we're going to come up with a better solution. I think that's one of the biggest wins. It makes sense. I know uh, you get rid of the jurisdictional stuff, and it's. Uh, I know I was a volunteer firefighter at one point. It was, you know, you, you have an accident on the on the line, and, you know, somebody's in the car you know, needing to get cut out, and the fire Firefighters are fighting about which, you know, right. whose who's call it is right. because they want the uh, the check mark or something like that. But I think that some of the data that's coming out of uh, not just your office, but you know, the state in general. I mean, there's an awful lot that's out there to analyze. I mean, it's almost too much, but it's uh, whatever you want to make of it. You can, you've got enough opportunity to make of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at the crime statistics that have moved, and, and I think generally the crime has gone down in the last couple of years, not by leaps and bounds. Uh, and that would be a general crime. Certainly, there's other ones. I know murder tends to be up a little bit, yep. but that can attribute, I would probably attribute a good portion of that to Baltimore City and the problems Certainly. that they have um, operating under their um, the agreement that they've got and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the up, up people they have with their police uh, commissioners. Certainly. <laughs> um, what, what's next? I think that what's next for us is to continue that collaboration. You know, so if we can continue to keep people talking and, and John, you mentioned the data. One of the things that the governor is really having us focus on is making sure that we're utilizing evidence-based principles, that we are funding programs that we know work and we can show that work. So as we can use data to show that we're having an impact, uh, I think that that's going to continue to grow. In order to get to that spot, we need people sharing data. We need people collaboration and trusting one another so that we can move that forward. So I think that's what you're going to see more of, this collaboration. Data is fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. The website for your, it's, you can actually, you can just uh, sort of Google it or it's under the governor's office of crime control and prevention. Crime, yep. You've got crime reports by county, by jurisdiction, by state, by types of crime. Uh, so you can actually see exactly what's there. Uh, you can see all of the, the grants that you're doing, all of the people that are the beneficiaries mm-hmm. of your grants. And I think it's uh, it's been very, very transparent, both certainly through your, your department as well as, you know, in the, in the administration in general. Mm-hmm. When was this established? Was this, this 
the governor's office of coordinating office, was this established under Hogan or was this something that had been around for? So the governor's office of crime control and prevention actually was established back in 1995. Uh, so we, our office has been around for a long time. We're actually a collaboration between two separate entities that they brought together in 1995. And since then, I think you've seen the office change. You know, under Governor Hogan, you know, we talked about the grants that we do, but we also do a lot of facilitation and collaboration of projects. You know, the governor has started projects like Handle with Care, the Maryland Criminal Intelligence Network, um, and those types of programs that we're driving forward. So you're seeing more of the collaboration through programming as well. Glenn Fuston, who is the executive director of the Governor's Office of Crime and oh, that's such a long Governor's Office of Crime Control and Control prevention. and Prevention, yep. you are tasked with you know keeping tabs on crime in the state of Maryland and re- reallocating resources to where they need to go the best. That's what we do. Thank you. Doing a hell of a job. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.